Well, I admit, uh, when I come to the subject of roller coasters, I, I, really, I really want to be this person. I mean, that, that's who I want to be, fully embracing, but, but so often I, I really end up like this person. Because <laughs> the, the thing is, when you come to the top of a hill on that roller coaster, there's one essential question. Can I trust? Can I trust the maker of the roller coaster? Can I trust the car itself? What about the 17-year-old who's operating the safety system? <laughs> Can I trust? Right? Well, welcome to 2015. Where I believe our key question, not just individually, but as a church family, is going to be, can we trust? Can we trust God? Can I trust God? Can you trust God? And that's what our new series, Don't Stop Believing, is all about. It's about a man named Abraham uh, and his story. He had an extraordinary relationship with God. And if you're familiar with the, the Bible story, you, we tend to think of it starting right in Genesis chapter 12, where God calls out to Abraham. But really, the story begins in Genesis chapter 11, and that's where we're going to be today. So if you want to follow along on the screen, you can if you have a Bible. Turn there to Genesis chapter 11. Now, the first uh, 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are really dealing with the history of all humankind, right? I mean, there's the creation by God of the heavens and the earth. Uh, there's the, the fall of Adam and Eve and the curse that then spreads throughout the world, right? There's, there's the flood of Noah in response to the unrighteousness in the world. There's the Tower of Babel, or Babel, where the, the people conspire to rise up to God, and He separates them into nations and into languages. And we covered all those things last year in our series on Genesis, but when the story gets to that point, having dealt with the history of all humans, it begins to focus on certain humans, particularly the people of Israel. And so all of this grand story begins to be focused in on one people. And here today we're going to see it focus on one family, one family. But it starts uh, in chapter 11, about verse 10. It, it starts with one of those parts of the Bible well, the parts we usually skip over. Okay, at least I do. The genealogies, right? The lists of names. Long, long list of who begat who or, or whom or who was a father of who and, and how it goes. And, and these lists are usually long. And we skip over them. But these lists were very important to the people who wrote them because they, they showed where you came from. And they showed where it was all going. And so in this huge transition in the book of Genesis from, from the history of the whole world to begin now to focus in on one particular people and one particular family, there's this long genealogy, name after name after name after name. And the list is focusing on our guy Abraham. It's all funneling. It's all coming to a point with our guy Abraham. And if you look down in verse 27, you'll see that. It says, this is the account of Terah's family line. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran became the father of Lot. Abram, that's our guy Abraham. His name is currently Abram. Later, God changes it to Abraham. We'll talk about that uh, later. I'll, I'll probably get mixed up and call him Abram and Abraham. Don't, don't let that bother you. Same guy, okay? So this long genealogy, it's all coming to a point in this family, Abram. And, and verse 29 shows us his wife. It says, Abram and Nahor, his brother, they both married. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. Now later, her name will also be changed to Sarah. And that's how we most often refer to her. But Sarai, Sarah, same person. And so this, this whole creation, this whole history of humankind, then this long family of line, family line all the way coming down 
to the story of Abram's family. But then something curious happens in verse 30. Look at verse 30. It says, now, now Sarai was childless because she was not able to conceive. So here's this long family line. It's all focused in on Abraham and Sarah. And right here at the very beginning of the story, we read this startling news. Sarai can't have children. She's barren. She has no kids, not because of her choice, but because she cannot. And all of a sudden, this family line comes to a dead end. This is it. It's the end. There's going to be no further genealogy for this family, right? There's no foreseeable future for this family, for these people. And so that seems a little uh, unusual, uh, a hard way to start. It's been a great run for this family, and now it's all come to a stop because Sarai is barren. She can have no kids. And so there's no human power that exists that can create or can invent for him, for her, for them, any kind of future. So they're hopeless, without hope. And you know, it's not just them, though, because the story of Abraham and Sarah, in so many ways, it parallels the situation of all human families, that that we all, in the most profound ways, are barren, hopeless, no foreseeable future. The, the New Testament says it this way, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, without hope, without God in the world. Before you met and responded in faith to Jesus Christ as the Son of God, you were barren in the biggest way, disconnected from God, no foreseeable future, no power on your own to do anything about it. And so when we come to this story, we're going to see a parallel between their lives, their journey, as well as ours in their barrenness. Now, maybe you can relate a little bit today. Maybe as you're sitting here and you're contemplating 2015, you have in the background somewhere an ache, a sense of barrenness. Maybe you've You've tried lots of things to to silence or to satisfy the ache in your life, but nothing's worked. And so this year you've decided, maybe God, maybe God's the answer. Or maybe you've tried God, you've tried the God thing, And, and, and though you've gone through the motions and you've done the things that people say you ought to do, there's still that barren ache in the back of your mind. Maybe you're fine with God, but when you, when you walk outside and look at your community or when you read the newspaper, you see, you see injustice, you see war, you see pain, you see things that, that they just aren't the way that they ought to be. And so it's left you hopeless. You, you wonder about the future, your future. And it's not just individuals who can feel this barrenness, this hopelessness. Communities can, churches can, right? We've just experienced a tremendous Christmas season, lots of fun, very exciting, God at work. But then, you know, if you walk in here today without the screens and the decorations and the lights, it might just feel like, uh, just another year, back to normal. Nothing really changed. That's where Abraham and Sarah find themselves today at the beginning of this journey. They're at a dead end, barren, no foreseeable future. But then we move from chapter 11 to chapter 12. And scholars say that, that the break between chapter 11 and chapter 12 is the most significant break in the whole Old Testament. Because right into their barren situation, something dramatic is going to happen. It's in chapter 12, verse 1. God is going to speak. It says, the Lord had said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land that I will show you. 
The Lord had said. God said. God spoke. That's why it's important for us to read Genesis chapter 11 before we read chapter 12, because it isn't out of nowhere that God speaks. It's directly into the barrenness of their lives, right at their dead end, that God speaks. And before we talk about what He speaks, let's talk for a moment about the fact that He speaks. Because this is an essential and important assertion. And our our whole question, the big question of, can you trust God? It starts really with this question, the belief that God is and that God speaks. That there is something, there is someone other outside of ourselves with the ability, with the power to speak into and act on our lives and our situations. And this assertion is counter to everything that our world wants us to believe, which is essentially that you are alone. We are alone. That there is nothing other. And depending on how you take that, that can lead you to great and tremendous pride. You know, the world is my oyster. I can make whatever I want out of it. Or despair. There's no power in heaven or earth that can make any difference, real difference, in my life. And right into that barren, hopeless situation, God speaks. Because the Bible's message is that God is and that He speaks. And that barrenness and hopelessness just happens to be His specialty. That's where He shows up. Are you barren today? Hopeless? Can you begin by believing that God is and that He speaks? Well, what does He speak? I mean, if God's going to speak, what's He going to say? Is He going to chastise these people? Is He going to point blame? Is He going to tell them why they're in the hopeless situation they're in? Is He going to chastise them? Is He going to give them commands? What's He going to say? Well, when we read verse 1, which is the first part of what God says to them, it certainly sounds like a command. God tells Abraham something, right? He says, go. Go from your country, your people, your father's household. Go to the land that I will show you. And there certainly is a call here from God to Abraham. It is a command. He's charging him with something. But what I want you to see this morning is that that command, that call, is part of something bigger. And that something bigger is this. God is making a promise. God is giving a promise to Abram and to Sarai and ultimately to us. Go, he says, from your country and your people to the land that I will show you. So if he's calling him to do something, if he's sending him somewhere, what he's promising is is that somewhere will be there when you get there. Does that make sense? He's promising them a home, a land, a place to call their own. Now, this is an outlandish promise when you think about it. But this idea of the promised land becomes the center of so much of the Old Testament. In fact, the word land or the land is used about 900 times in the Old Testament. And just about every single one of them is a reference to this land, the land that God says to Abraham, I'm promising to you. It's a really big deal. And he's going to need this land because verse 2 says something even more outlandish, that he's going to have descendants, right? I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. You're going to be a great nation. So God is promising to this man, Abraham, whose wife is barren, who's at a dead end, he says, by the way, you're going to have so many descendants, it'll be a nation. 
There's going to be a time later in the story where God says to Abraham, you know how many descendants you're going to have? Look up at the sky, count the stars. Look at the sand at the beach, count the grains of sand. That's how many. That is an outlandish promise that he makes to God. That's a future. It's an amazing future. Abraham's promised a future from being a dead-end family to a never-ending family. And the promise gets even more outrageous because the end of verse 2 implies something else. And you will be a blessing. Think about this for a moment. The story begins with Abram and Sarah at a dead end, barren. So in their culture, that would mean they were the people you'd have pity on. They're the people you'd feel sorry for. They've got no future. Right? Now, God says, you know what I promise you? I promise that you will go from being the people that are pitied to the people who provide blessing. You're going to be a blessing to others. Verse 3 says, I will bless those who bless you. I'm going to curse those who curse you. And all peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. You see how outrageous that is to promise this barren couple that? You're going to have a future. You're going to have a land. You're going to be the father of a nation. Everybody is going to end up being blessed through you. That's a pretty big deal. But it's a promise that God makes. And so what Abram's going to have to do is answer our essential question. Can he trust God to keep his promise? You notice that what God promises to Abraham is really what, at our deepest level, we all crave. Do you notice that? I, I will give you a land. I will make you a nation. There will be security for you. There will be provision for you. There will be prominence for you. I will make your name great. All of the things that we crave for, God is signaling to Abraham that those things, they're a gift. They come from God. The world is not your oyster. It's God's. And so, Abram, the things that you need for your future, they come from me, and I'm the one who graciously bestows them. But like I said, it's, it's all going to come down to this outlandish, outrageous promise which requires Abraham to make a decision, right? He's going to have to make a response. From this moment on, Abraham's whole life is going to be ordered around this question. Will he live for the promise or will he live against the promise? Will he believe and trust God or will he decide that he needs to stay where he is and do things the way he thinks that they work? It's going to be a constant question, right? Will he leave his present reality behind and take on a risky future? It's almost like God is saying to stay safe, to stay with what you know means to remain barren. But to take a great risk, to believe in my promise, that's where you'll find blessing. And it's going to be the whole ordering of Abraham and Sarah's life from this moment on. Can Abraham trust God and he, can he trust that God can keep his promise? You know, similarly, God makes promises to us of a new future and of great blessing, right? Dead in our trespasses and sins, without God and without hope, Jesus is the one who speaks into that and says, if you follow me, you'll have everlasting life right? If you remain in me, you'll have a life that bears much fruit. If you believe in me and come to me, you'll have life to the full. Not just life in heaven one day, but the fullness of life that begins now. Participation in the kingdom of God now. Being a channel of God's blessing now to those around you. God makes those kinds of promises to us. God promises our faith community. God promises our church. I will build your church. And the gates of hell won't stand against it. Right? 
God promises that His kingdom will come, that life and hope and blessing and justice and peace will be on earth just like they are in heaven. The question is, like Abraham, can you trust God to keep His promise? Because God's promise means a dangerous departure from our current reality, from the way we and our world views things. It's reflected in the words of Jesus uh, in Mark chapter 8. It's Jesus who says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. To stay safe, to hold on to what you know and the way you think the world works, that is not the path to God's blessing. To follow Jesus, to have His promises and His blessing, it requires releasing your life, letting go of your current reality, and embracing His promises and His future. So God's promise to us, just like to Abraham, requires a response. Can the speaking God be trusted? Can we fling ourselves down the track, so to speak? Come what may, that's the question. And with all of this hanging in the balance for Abraham and ultimately for all the peoples of the earth who stand to be blessed through him, what's Abraham going to do? And the answer comes simply in verse 4. In verse 4, it just says, so Abram went. So Abram went. There's no questions, no discussion, no argument. Abram went. He accepts and he embraces God's promise. Now, it's going to get a little complicated. Otherwise, this would be a one-week series, you know. We just end it right here. Abraham and Sarah, they're going to live life just like you and I do. They're going to experience heights and depths. There are going to be times when God seems close and when God seems far. There are going to be times when they respond to God really well and times when they, they sort of lose track of what God's doing. But it's all couched from the beginning in this response. Abram went. He embraces it. Just as the Lord told him. And it says, and Lot went with him. And we're going to see in the coming weeks how this is a statement about leaving behind what he had and following God, right? Letting go of what he knew, making the move and the life of faith uh, and, the, and the decision to go forward. That's very important. And what he has to do, this is important, he has to relinquish his present to embrace his future. And this is the reason why I, and, and maybe you, don't always experience the fullness of the blessing that God has for us in the new life. Because we want to hold on to our present while we embrace the promise. You see, like Abraham, we have to be willing to relinquish our present. Our present meaning, for me, meaning uh, my current situation, my, my comfort, my level of security, the way I've ordered my life to sort of be the way that I want it, the level of comfort that I have, my willingness to see the world. Also, the way that I'm sometimes swayed by the world and the world's philosophy that in order to make things go, it really is up to me, right? That, that's kind of how I sometimes look at life. And when we do that, we want to hold on to that and say, God, I know you've promised me something and I want to move in faith. It, it becomes con a conflict. And so when Abraham says, when it says that Abram went, it means he was... He was willing to relinquish his present so that he could have his future. I want you to notice, too, that it says he was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. 75 years old. You know, don't let being 75 years old make you think God's future is beyond you. Don't think for one minute that you've reached a stage or a place in your life where that is for others. 
where God may be finished with you. Abram was 75 when it started. So Abraham accepts and he embraces this promise. And what it does is it launches him on this journey. Look at the next verse. Notice what he does. It says, so he went. Well, where did he go? Verse 5 says, he took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan. And they arrived there. Abram traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Morah at Shechem. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there, he went on toward the hills east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent. With Bethel on the west and Ai on the east, there he built an altar to the Lord, and he called on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Now, if you followed along on a map when we were reading these verses, what you'd notice is this is a description of Abram traveling to this territory that God has promised and him traveling north and south and east and west and just traveling through it. So there's sort of a geography lesson here. This is the land, right? But there's a lot more going on here than just a geography lesson because What happens from this moment on is that the idea of journey, of travel, that becomes the primary metaphor for the life of faith. When Abram accepts the call of God, when he embraces the promise of God, it launches him on a journey. And that journey is going to be a picture of what it means to follow God. Because Abram's going to keep moving. He's not going to stop. The life of faith is not stationary. It moves because God is always on the move. And that's what we're going to see with Abram. He's in constant pursuit of the promise. He never stops. The life of faith is like that. It's a journey. It might begin with a moment of decision, a, a decision to trust God, to believe Him, but it always continues in constant motion, constant pursuit. And it's hard. It's dangerous. It's going to be hard. It's going to be dangerous for Abram. Did you you notice in verse 6 where it said, uh, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land? That's a little foreshadowing of some bad news. Abram shows up in this land, and guess what? There's people living there. They're Canaanites. You know what Canaanites are? Canaanites are people who don't believe the promise. They don't believe the promise. The call of God, the the life of faith, it always occurs in the presence of those who don't believe the promise. Listen, that's why those street signs are back up on the wall this week. It's a reminder That this life of faith we pursue with God, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It happens in the presence of those who don't believe the promise. It's for the sake of those who don't believe the promise. In the same way that Abram is going to be a blessing, a channel of God's blessing to all the peoples, that's the same is true for us today. But it begins with him embarking on this dangerous, difficult journey of faith. And the, the lives of the Canaanites, it's going to be dangerous at some points in the story, but, but more so, it's just going to be that the lives of those who don't believe the promise look awfully attractive. They look awfully successful, especially when there are times that it's going to take God a long time to do some things. And in the midst of that, and the Canaanites' life can look pretty good. You know, it might be the way that you feel on, on a Sunday morning, you know, when you've got everybody finally washed and cleaned and pressed and you shove four kids into the car and you, you, you are all frazzled already and you begin to head to church and you go by and there's your neighbor and he's in his bathrobe and he's, he's got his coffee and he's picking up the paper. And you think, that, that looks pretty good, <laughs> right? The journey of faith is going to be difficult and dangerous. It might require you, who knows, to change careers. 
to exchange futures, change friends. You might have a dangerous conversation with someone about forgiving them. You might take a risky step of loving your neighbor. I want you to see one more thing about Abram that helps us as we embark on this life, this dangerous journey of faith. It was in verse 8. And it talks about him going to a couple of places and he builds an altar to the Lord. And I want you to see that last phrase where it says, and he called on the name of the Lord. Now, that's not just a throwaway phrase. It's going to mean something very important. In the Old Testament, to call on the name of the Lord means two things. There's two times when we call on the name of the Lord. The first is when we are praising Him. And so the psalmist write, we call on the name of the Lord and we give Him praise. The other time that the Old Testament writes about us calling on the name of the Lord is when we're in trouble. We call on the name of the Lord to save us, to help us. We petition Him. And so I think this is the writer's way of saying, in all of his life, in every circumstance of his life, Abram turned to God. In the good times and in the hard times, his whole life responded to God. And that's the kind of response it takes to, en to enjoy, to endure the life of faith that results in the blessing and the promise of God. It's everything. Abraham's our model of what it means to accept and embrace the life of God. He's talked about over and over again in the New Testament as a model of faith. And Peter modeled this when he spoke up to Jesus and he said, we've left everything to follow you. That's what it means. That's what it means to embark on the life of faith, to leave everything. And that's where we're headed this year, I believe. Like never before, I, my prayer is that God is going to ask you, show you how to move in faith like never before. For us as a family, I believe that He's going to show us, ask us to take steps towards a future unlike anything ever before. It promises to be a wild ride. But it revolves around one essential question. Can God be trusted to keep His promises? I'm going to ask the band to make their way back up because we're going, to, we're going to finish with a song, which is really going to be an opportunity, a time for us to reflect this to God. Maybe, maybe in a new way, you want to say yes. You want to embrace the promise of God. Uh, maybe for a new step of faith, something you know you're facing in 2015, and you want to just begin the year by saying, God, I'm going to accept and embrace your promises, that you're for me. Maybe just as a church, as we gather, you want to be a person who says, whatever God has, however He directs us as a family, we accept and we will embrace what God leads us to do. Maybe for the very first time, maybe you've never said that to God. Maybe you've never accepted His promise, His offer through Jesus Christ of new life. And you would like to start this year by saying yes to Him. As we have a moment to sing together, would you let those thoughts, those intentions of your heart well up because, because this is going to be a great and wild ride.